On the 8th of February, 1587, after what must have felt like a lifetime of imprisonment, the spanned almost 20 years, the Queen of Scotland was executed at the behest of her cousin, something Elizabeth I of England would later regret. Mary, Queen of Scots, had been through a lot in her life. She had three marriages, a son, an abdication of her throne. But the thing that really sealed her fate was this. Mary was a Stuart, and under the laws of Henry VIII, Stuarts were forbade to rule on the English throne. So when Mary I became queen, it was her sister Elizabeth I that became her heir. In the eyes of the Catholics, however, it should have been Mary, Queen of Scots. She was a Catholic, an anointed queen, and she had the same royal blood flowing through her veins. You see, her grandmother was the sister of Henry. Now this posed a giant threat to Elizabeth, a threat not just to her crown, but to her life. And when Elizabeth became queen, the threat became stronger. Many plots were devised to oust her, and eventually Elizabeth had Mary under lock and key. After Mary's abdication of the Scottish throne and Mary seeking shelter in England, Elizabeth made sure that Mary would forever no longer be a threat and held her under house arrest for almost two decades. Now Mary, although a prisoner of Elizabeth, lived in relative comfort. She was moved occasionally from different castles and houses, but eventually she found herself at Fotheringhay Castle. The events that led to this? Mary was found to have been complicit in a plot called the Babington Plot. She was arrested whilst out riding on the 11th of August and taken to a place called Tixall Hall in Staffordshire. She thought any letters that she was sending were secure, but she had been misled. And her letters were ultimately intercepted and deciphered and read by Elizabeth I's spymaster, Francis Walsingham. The letters ultimately secured her death and a warrant was made and it was clear that Mary had sanctioned an attempt on Elizabeth's life. Then a journey of four days began and Mary found herself in Fotheringhay Castle on the 25th of September 1586, the place where she would later lose her head. In the October, Mary's trial began. She faced 36 noblemen for the act of treason under the Act for the Queen's Safety. She was spirited and denied the charges, but it made no difference. You see, only one man out of the 36 felt any hesitancy in her sentencing. Look to your consciences and remember that the theatre of the whole world is wider than the Kingdom of England. Mary said this, but it was in vain. She had been denied access to review the evidence against her, and was also denied any legal counsel. She also stated that as a foreign anointed queen, she should not be tried or convicted of treason under English law. Then on the 25th of October, Mary was convicted and sentenced to death. Elizabeth was hesitant to order the execution. Even with pressure from parliament, Elizabeth felt it was wrong to kill a queen she felt it would set a dangerous precedent and was fearful of the consequences. Elizabeth even looked at a way to find a way to end Mary's life in a more clandestine way with her final custodian, but this was refused with the custodian saying that he would not make a shipwreck of my conscience or leave so great a blot on my poor posterity. So on the 1st of February, Elizabeth signed the warrant and then on the 3rd of February, without Elizabeth's knowledge, the Privy Council set to arranging the execution. So then, on the 7th of February, 1587, Mary was told that she would be executed the next day. The thoughts and feelings that must have flown through her mind, was she scared? Was it a relief? An end to the 20 years of her captivity? Now Mary spent her final night in prayer. She distributed her belongings to her household and she wrote her will and then sent a letter to the King of France. Now Mary's place of execution was to be the Great Hall of Fotheringhay Castle. It was set up with the scaffold placed in the middle and had been decorated with a huge amounts of black cloth, a block, a cushion for her to kneel on and stools for her and the two earls of Shrewsbury and Kent who were there to witness. 
Mary was then brought through from her chambers and she climbed up the steps to the scaffold. The executioner was named Bull and he and his assistant knelt before her and they asked for her forgiveness. Mary replied with, I forgive you with all my heart, for now I hope you shall make an end to all my troubles. Mary was then assisted in removing her outer garments and this revealed a velvet petticoat and a crimson brown sleeves. These were the colours of martyrdom in the Catholic Church. Mary also wore a black satin bodice with black trimmings. She also then made a small joke as she was being disrobed that she had never had such grooms before, nor had she put her clothes off in such a company. Mary had been accompanied by her ladies, Jane Kennedy and Elizabeth Curl. Jane Kennedy was the one who placed an embroidered white veil as a blindfold over Mary's eyes, and then Mary knelt down on the cushion in front of the block and positioned her head and outstretched her arms. She then said, In manest house, domain, commendo spiritum meum, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Now you would have thought that one strike would have been all it took. Mary deserved that at least. She'd been imprisoned for so long, but no, the first strike missed. It struck the back of her head. The second strike severed her neck, but the third act, this time using the ax as a knife to cut the remaining bit of sinew was required. Mary's execution was botched. Her death was bloody and unnecessary. Then afterwards, the executioner held up her head and declared, God save the queen. But the fiasco didn't end there. As Mary's head was held up to the crowd, it slipped from the wig the executioner was holding and fell to the floor. This revealed that Mary, in fact, had very short grey hair and not auburn, as the wig suggested. An eyewitness stated that her lips stirred up and down for a quarter of an hour after her head had been cut off and that a small dog owned by the Queen emerged from hiding among her skirts. And then, after Mary was killed, all of her belongings and clothes and everything that her blood had touched was thrown into a great fire within the Great Hall of Fotheringhay Castle. This was to prevent relic hunters getting their hands on anything. Now, Elizabeth claimed to be furious that Mary had been executed, she distanced herself from the spilling of another queen's blood. And she also denied Mary's request to be buried in France and instead buried her within the walls of Peterborough Cathedral. But that sadly was around five months after Mary had been executed. And Mary was then just left to rot in a coffin within the antechamber of the castle. Elizabeth had killed her off. The threat was over, but now, she just did not know what to do with her remains. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.